facility on Keast Boulevard. My nephew Cedric had come down to spend some days with me in the summer. Cedric lives in San Francisco. He had flown down to Dallas to spend some time with me, and when he did that, it was a wonderful time. But Cedric had this Game Boy, this, this portable game, this electronic game that he was playing. And so I was working at the office there on Keast, and while in my office, I'm meeting with someone, and the meeting ran over. A banker was downstairs waiting to meet with me. And Cedric decided to entertain him. Cedric is playing with him on his Game Boy. And so as soon as I come down, I, the banker looks at me and says, your nephew is something else. We've been playing his Game Boy, and I have yet to win a game. But I've discovered something. Every time I learn the game, that's when he changes the rules. I then couldn't resist. I said, oh, I guess you just had the black treatment. You understand understand what it means to be black in the United States of America because every time that we learn the game, that's when y'all decide <clears throat> to change the rules. Well, my brothers and sisters, you understand that in life, if every time you get good at the game, that's when they change the rules. You are in automatically a no-win situation. You can't win for losing. That's the situation that was just illustrated on on the screen. Uh, those of you who are civil rights historians already know that this was leading up to the march from Selma to Montgomery, but you already know it was in the aftermath of Bloody Sunday. Bloody Sunday had taken place on the second Sunday in March of 1965. Uh, already Jimmy Lee Jackson had been shot and killed uh, trying to register to vote, and then uh, John Lewis and those from SNCC on Bloody Sunday had determined to march across the Edmund Pettus Bridge, but they were met by state troopers, and the state troopers had beat them and bloodied them. It was horrific what they had done. It was a nightmare of epic proportions. It was racial brutality at its worst in this country, and now it's a few days later. Check out what has happened. People have come from all around the country to join the march from Selma to Montgomery. But check out what's going down. As they have come down to Selma, a judge has issued an injunction. The judge says you cannot march right now. On top of that, Lyndon Baines Johnson has told Dr. King, I don't want you marching right now. But they gather and begin to march. And as they march, they come up to the Edmund Pettus Bridge. You saw the scene, didn't you? There are state troopers, evidently some of the same troopers that had been there only a few days before and had violently beaten those innocent and non-violent marchers who were simply trying to get a voting rights bill passed. But check out what happened as they come up to the troopers. What do they do? The uh, screen showed you they knelt down and prayed. Did you see them kneeling down and praying? They are praying in front of the state troopers, and then uh, when they rise from their prayers, the state troopers are there. But understand, uh, Dr. King has a decision to make. The state troopers that had beaten and bloodied them uh, only days before are standing in front of them. Uh, on top of that, the judge has enjoined them and told them, uh, you cannot march. If you, vi if you march across this bridge, you will violate the judicial injunction.
injunction. And then the President of the United States, who has been a friend to the policies of the civil rights struggle, has said, Dr. King, I don't want you to march. But then you have all of these people that have come from around the country. And as Andy Young said, they are experiencing a freedom high. They had seen people get beaten and bloodied, and they wanted to get beaten and bloodied. What could Dr. King do? I like what you got, what you saw on the screen. He knelt down and prayed. And with that being the case, you understand in that moment, Martin Luther King Jr. experiencing the lowlands of leadership discovers that every now and then, as a leader, you are in a no-win situation. Every now and then, as a human being, I don't care how big your Bible is, how long you've been going to church, and how much you name it, claim it, and frame it, blab it, and grab it, you will get in a no-win situation. And I'm talking to somebody right now, ain't I? Because you were in a no-win situation on your job. On your job, the boss is trying to step to you, but you ain't feeling the boss like that. But if you respond wrong, then the sad reality is it can haunt and harass your money and mess with your future. It's called a no-win situation. I could call the roll, but fill your blank in because all of us have been there. All of us know what it's like to experience a no-win situation. If that's how you feel, Christian West Baptist Church.